thanks everyone. Good to see everyone again. You might want to bring your volume up unless it's just me. Okay. I have it set for, I have it set for fairly low for uh, playing. Can you hear? Can you hear? Yes, now? I've adjusted. So. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, welcome to the second uh, season, I guess you would call it of view. Um, we're going to cover just a little bit of what we went over last season, just the uh, tip of the iceberg. And then we're going to take it from there and try to, uh, you know, forward the gears on it. So we kind of uh, shed some more light on some of those concepts that we talked about. So we started off, uh, my first recording, as some of you people might know, is uh, the record Cow People. That was in 31 tone. Yes, more. Okay. How's that? Better? Okay. So yeah, Cow People was with uh, with with Johnny Reinhardt on uh, electric bassoon. We had a vocalist singing um, mostly sounds, uh, fretless bass. We had tune drums. Tune they were um, roto toms and regular drums. Roto toms can be tuned just by you know pivoting the drum a little. You can tune it on the spot. So uh, that was really the start of you know our recording. Uh, in and we did uh, some thirty one tone pieces before that. But um, 31 tone is a tremendous system to start with, I believe. Uh, it has mm -hmm. so many advantages. The first one for me was these movable harmonic seventh chords. So um, since this is the first uh, session of a, of a new season here at Moo, we're going to talk a little bit about the blues because that's kind of a bedrock music for a lot of people, especially a lot of American music. Um, and how do we uh, how do we find our way into the blues, which was originally a microtonal music? It was originally guys out in the field playing, tuning to an open chord without a tuner, putting a slide on top of that, singing fretlessly on top of that, and really going more for the feeling of the notes instead of theoretical pitches. So the intuition, intuitive process in the blues was, you know very foremost in these guys' minds, they, they felt these notes and had to go to them. And how do we now, all these years later, take those notes and kind of try to figure out what they are and how we can use them in blues as a bedrock for rock, you know, classical, uh, all other, other types of music. So we'll look a little bit about at that. Um, in Cow People, like I said, those 31 tone equal tempered frets, as some of you guys know, gives you such great harmonic seventh chords. The thirds and harmonic sevenths are so great that you basically have 31 different, uh, you know, seventh chords, which is unusual. Other, even just intonation systems, you hardly get that. Yes, Johnny. I think there's still a question about volume. I can adjust my mic, but uh, Jacques is having difficulty. Stephen's having uh, difficulty. How is this now? Better? Not that different to me. Is, is the mic loud enough? All right, we have a tech expert, Dave Borden, coming up here and increasing the gain on the mic. How oh, boy. Uh, All right. right. When you play, it's going to get really loud. So you Okay, turn it down a little bit. Okay. Okay. Okay, we'll have to adjust it for the musical examples, but uh, all, all good? Not too loud? Okay, so we were talking about 31 tone and the fact that you have these movable harmonic seventh chords, you have 31 different, you know, perfect seventh, seven over five tritones. And in a just intonation system, that's very hard to come by because you need so many notes. Um, but since we got used to it in 31 tone, there is a way to get it in just intonation fretting. So um, playing the 31 tone, we had gone to see, uh, Johnny and I, we had gone to see Lamont Young and I told that story about how his music affected us. And I realized that 31 tone, as, as great as it was and all these options that it offered, I, I also wanted to hear something else, which was pure harmonic series and see how we could combine those notes to get the vibrations and effects that Lamont was getting. So I spent two months designing my first JI guitar system. That one had 49 notes per octave on it with an interchangeable fingerboard. And I wanted to hear the undertones and the overtones, like Harry Parch. He had the, his whole system was undertones on one and overtones on the other, and he would use minor and major in that way, and it was extremely uh, effective, I thought. 
the way he did that. And also the Undertones series created a whole new world of a scale that was not comparable to any scale in the Overtone series. But it was undeniably potent and still is. So uh, how do you translate this to modern day times if you want to get into a just intonation system? Um, I'm a guitar player composer, so I'll, I'll focus a little on guitar, but we've also got keyboards here that we retune and um, you know, we do flutes and uh, other instruments, all different pitches. So um, the guitars that I designed, uh, one of the first ones I did after the JI system, it took me years because everyone said, well, 12 tone is over here and just intonations over here and never the twain shall meet. You can't put them together. They're opposite systems, they don't coexist. So after thinking about that and playing for about 20 years, I, I realized something that you could have a, you could use each one of the 12 tone pitches as a fundamental, so to speak, of its own JI system. And to do that, you would add just intonation frets to the 12 tone frets. So you keep the 12 12 tone frets in place. That way you can play every Beatles song you ever played. You still have those frets. But we added one fret between each of those. And we thought that was an intuitive way to keep that 12 in it. We're so used to 12 that we just added another 12 frets. Of course, that added 24 more pitches because all the mm -hmm. guitar strings aren't tuned to the same note. So we had 36 different pitches in a, in a standard tuning. Um, and it was very, I thought, fairly easy to play once you realize that every other fret was a 12 tone fret. There was um, two frets for, uh, three frets for harmonic 11ths two frets for harmonic thirteenths, and the other frets were harmonic sevenths. So we had complete um, seven, 11, 13 scales on um, all the strings. One thing you wanna do when you're de designing a fretting system, um, if you're starting from scratch, you wanna think about it, you wanna put the frets where the nodes of the strings are. So that was a driving factor. If, if you're playing a major third, you want that major third, <laughs> Sorry about that. You want that major third to be right where that harmonic is, because that's where the node is, so that the string is naturally pausing there, and uh, that's in, that's why if you press the string lightly, you'll get that harmonic. So one of the first things I did was put the frets where the nodes of the strings were. Um, you know, we all are used. To, we've grown up with this Ptolemic sequence. And, uh, you know, I believe Ptolemy was, he was a smart guy, of course. He's, he's the one that said, the, one of the ones that said the earth was flat. So he'd probably be a flat earther today. So some of his things maybe didn't pan out. And the Ptolemic sequence was extremely useful. Everybody uses it, you hear on the radio constantly. Um, but his Ptolemic sequence was in JI. It was a pure JI uh, Ptolemic sequence. It wasn't the 12 tone one. So we have that on the, on the guitar also on the string. But when you look at the harmonic series, there's a, a complete scale that happens from the 8th harmonic to the 16th harmonic. And that's the first complete scale that you see in that harmonic series. Before that, it's 1 to 2 is an octave. Uh, 2 to 4, there's just a perfect 5th in there. 4 to 8, it does have a triad and a 7th chord in there. But it's not a complete scale. So when you go 8 to 16, you get this complete scale, the 8th harmonic, 9th, 10th, all the way up to 16. And these notes are... In uh, the present day, what we would call them, a 12-tone player would, would say it's close to a Lydian flat 7 scale. Lydian because the 4th is sharp. In this sense, it's the 11th harmonic. It's just a quarter tone sharp. And the flat 7 is the harmonic 7. So the funny thing about 8 through 16 is when you have a flat harmonic 7 that's purely in tune, that 15th harmonic works great with it. You can play them both in the same chord. So... <laughs> There's a chord with both sevenths going to the four chord. So we call those 15 chords and they're consonant. Uh, but I also consider the 13th and 11th harmonics to be consonances. So um, the 11th is a type of tritone. It's a quarter tone flat tritone. But in a harmonic context, it can still be consonant, and in, in, even in a melodic context, I could still consider it consonant. Um, so uh, this guitar is 24 frets per octave, just like the 12 tone Ultra Plus guitar. The difference is that the 12 frets that represent 
the telemic sequence or the notes we're used to, those frets are all pure ratios on this guitar. It's called the 24 fret J.I. guitar, 24 fret just in the nation. So we've got E, F, F sharp, G, G sharp, A, all uh, as you would on a regular guitar, but these are purely tuned ratios. Um, then in between that, we also put the same uh, harmonic frets we had on the Ultra Plus. So we've got 24 frets in the octave, a lot of harmonic sevenths, uh, three elevenths, and three thir uh, two thirteenth frets. So um, then you get the question of how am I going to tune this guitar? Because the frets don't really bend to your will as far as tuning. The frets are what they are, and it's up to you to figure out. You know, it's like nature gives you these pitches, and then you have to figure out what am I going to do with them? How am I going to make this a practical system for me? So. Um, Well, uh, one thing we did with this 8 through 16 scale, we put two 8 through 16 scales on every string. So the open string has uh, an 8 through 16 scale of whatever that string is the fundamental of, but it also has a 8 through 16 scale of whatever that string is the perfect fifth of, or the third harmonic of. So, um, you have those two 8 through 16 scales on each string, plus the telemic sequence, and plus chromatic uh, connecting notes. So I'll just play you an example now of the E. Uh, this particular guitar is in uh, standard, what we call standard tuning. That, uh, this, the closest standard tuning to JI, or JI tuning to standard, is Pythagorean meaning it's kind of favoring the perfect fifths and the thirds are a little bit slighted. So in guitar, when you tune E, A, D, G, B, E, like a standard guitar player would, if all of those intervals are in perfect tune, you will end up with two different E notes on the top and bottom. And for a guitar player, that's counterintuitive. You want those strings to be the same. To get them to be the same, you have to insert a comma in the open strings. And that comma can go anywhere. On my 64 tone guitar, the comma is between the D and G string because we have a lot of split and partial frets that will cover up that comma and make it uh, a perfect fourth. On this guitar, the 24 fret JI, they're all straight frets for ease of playing and for manufacturing ease and, and uh, affordability and all those things. The frets go all the way across. There's no partial frets. So in this case, we decided to, on the Pythagorean tuning, we decided to make the, Pythagor the third that's on the guitar between G and B, that's a Pythagorean major third. Now we've also got the pure major third. So here's a Pythagorean major third, and here's the pure. Okay, once again, Pythagorean. It's a little shimmer to it, and here's the pure. No beats at all. So the Pythagorean tuning does not preclude pure uh, major thirds. We've got those all over the neck. It just makes it easier to get around and to give us certain, um, you know, simplified ways to get what we need. Okay, so I'll play that A through 16 scale on the E string, and this will be in the key of E. So it'll start with eight and go all the way up. That's 8 through 16 in E. Now I'll stay on the same E string, and I'm going to use the E string as if it was the third harmonic. In that case, if E is the third harmonic, we're in the key of A, and uh, that would be an A 8 through 16 scale, starting on the third harmonic E. So it'll go, you know, the third harmonic is the same as the sixth, which is the same as the twelfth. So it'll basically go 12, 13, 14, 15. 16 being A, then back to 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, up like that. So this is the A harmonic series, 8 through 16 on the E string. I'll play the A in the bass so you can hear it against the A. So that's
attached to two 8 through 16 scales on uh, one string. Uh, and that Ptolemic sequence would, in just intonation on that same string, would sound like this. So you've got all that on there, on each string, and whatever you tune that string to, you're going to get those relative pitches above it. So on a string tuned to A, you'll get the A harmonic series, but you'll also get the D harmonic series, because A is the perfect fifth of D. So when we add all this up, we can see that playing in the Pythagorean tuning, which the guitar players are used to, is not really what nature intended. They didn't really have that in mind for you. Uh, what, what, in order to appease the natural thing, you kind of want to play in an open tuning, which is hard for guitar players because we've got to forget every position and lick that we already know and go back to ground zero. So I've been doing that my whole life and I don't mind doing it because it puts you in a place where you realize how little you know. So even though I've been doing this for a long time, I enjoy knowing how little I know because that opens the vistas for me to learn something about um, uh, something that I don't know. So if that makes sense. Um, some people really object to having to, you know, be faced with the vast amount of stuff they don't know. I always figure the stuff I don't know is so much greater than, than what I do know that uh, ever since I brought my 31 tone and when I was at Berkeley I was a senior and Tillman Schaefer gave me a 31 tone acoustic I wrote a piece on it and brought it to my teacher John Damien who at that time was the top teacher at Berkeley for guitar he's just retired recently um, and I played him the piece and he really uh, was blown away by it and then he wanted to have the guitar so I gave him the 31 tone and of course he couldn't play just like me he couldn't play a C chord on it to start and he got very frustrated by that because he was the top reader and the, the top teacher. So he gave me the guitar back and told me to uh, play it, play the piece for his guitar ensemble You know, later that week. So I came in, played the piece for the guitar ensemble, and then he said, all right, great, let's improvise. And of course, I had just got the thing, wrote one piece I couldn't improvise yet. And um, I never know if he did that to light a fire under me or what, but it made me want to know even harder. I tried even harder to learn to improvise on 31 tone and um, that's what I learned to do. Um, so, but I did see people's reaction in the beginning to you know different frets and ever since then I've, I've gotten all kinds of reactions. I'm sure a lot of people here have also and hopefully we use it to inspire us and motivate us whether it's positive or negative energy they're feeding us, whatever it is, we can take that and, and try to take it to the next level and not be you know, dragged down by any of these um, attitudes. And there was only one other guy at Berkeley that ever even heard of microtonal music. Um, Kachinkas was his name, and he had escaped from uh, Czechoslovakia. And he was a microtonal composer there, but he had to leave his microtonal works behind when he left. And he never knew what happened to them. And um, so I sought him out at Berkeley because I needed to talk to someone. There was no Zoom, no Internet. Uh, I went to the top floor of the building where his room was, and it was a tiny closet-sized room. Um, and he was very happy to see me. And he was an older guy hunched over at a desk. And he seemed very happy that someone would visit him and wanted to you know, solicit information from him. As soon as I mentioned the microtonal stuff, he looked down and would not look back up on me. He had been so persecuted for writing this music that he was not able to discuss it. So um, that was my earlier experiences of seeing, you know, the power and both the dark and the light. And what I was trying to do, I was just trying to find out the truth of a note that I had heard when I was feeding back in my friend's garage where I used to practice. And I was feeding back and I heard the seventh, but it wasn't, I didn't have a fret for it. So now I got a bunch, a bunch of frets for that. And, um, you know, the music we were playing in those days was, it was rock, but it had, the harmonic series was in the distortion itself. And we were very influenced by the blues players, or most, more so by rock players who were influenced by blues players. So we had to go back once we learned that, uh, you know, Cream did a Robert Johnson song, we had to go back and listen to him and find out who this guy was, because we didn't know him. 
But after a while, we saw that, wow, these blues guys are really influencing everyone. Uh, you know, our favorites at the time were the English guitar players like uh, Eric Clapton. Jimi Hendrix was American, but made in England. Uh, Jeff Beck, uh, Leslie West, these guys you know, was from America. These guys used a lot of distortion and they controlled it and they also had controlled feedback. So today, um, September 18th, in 1970, uh, I had just turned 13 years old and I was walking through the living room looking at a tiny little thumbnail picture in the newspaper of a man named Jimi Hendrix. And it said that he had died that day, September 18th, 1970. And it said he was the world's greatest guitar player. And, um, you know, I was a trumpet player originally. My mother got me guitar lessons for Christmas and I said, Mom, I'm a trumpet player. What, what am I going to... She said, just try it. Just go, you know. And I tried it and I really took to it. But um, I thought of myself as a guitar player, but I did not know this man's music like I thought I should. So I took my sister's record of Are You Experienced, which she never listened to, and I just played it until I could play some of the stuff. As soon as I could play the guitar solo on the song Fire, I called my mother in and I played along with the solo on the record. And I gotta say, I was pretty proud of myself at that time to be able to do that. It was just copying someone, but you know, this guy was the best for a number of reasons. He's also the most microtonal guitar player because every note had English, it had whammy, it had, he was the feedback master. When you look at his Woodstock set, He's outdoors and just letting it fly, and he, it's incredible. So yeah, Hendrix died today. This is the anniversary of his passing. Um, and uh, as far as musicians that meant a lot to me when I was younger and still do, and I can still learn from him, he was the number one guy. So I'm gonna play a little tribute to him now, um, if I can get Meredith to turn the uh, volume down here because um, even though Jimmy's not here, uh, I'm gonna we're gonna try to conjure the ghost. Uh, the ghost. Hold on, hold on one second. The ghost of Hendrix here by doing um, when you trans transfer from 31 tone to just intonation, you get to deal with um, some more phenomena that's there in 31 tone, but you can quantize it better in in harmonic series tuning. And one of those things is that the frequencies have direct relationships to each other. So they create lower frequencies called difference tones, the difference between the two frequencies, and summation tones, the addition of the two frequencies. And this is something really obvious in Lamont's music, and um, we, can, we can do that here. So we're gonna do a little difference tone piece where I will play two high notes, but what will be coming out is a, is a line that I'm not playing. And that line, hopefully with any luck, will be uh, Jimmy's uh, song Spanish Castle Magic which is a blues because I was talking about cow people you know when we get to the improv section in cow people we played a 12 bar blues progression and that's what the solo is over so even in cow people I was going back and tapping into that um, the blues form and the blues feeling so um, Spanish Castle Magic is a blues and I'm gonna I'm not gonna be playing the lower pitches I'll start off by playing some of the higher pitches so you can hear what I'm actually playing then I'll turn up the amp game and what uh, that's John, do, yes. could you uh, maybe have the guitar a little higher up so we could see it while you play? Oh yeah, I'll be standing when I play, so the guitar will be uh, centered, hopefully. And, um, and we're going to turn the volume down for a minute now, because these different stones are loud, they're, they're bassy. So remember, the, the bass line that you're hearing is, is not being played. It's just the difference of the two frequencies on top. The two, I'm only playing the two higher strings, the high E and high B strings. So uh, let's see if we can get this going. Thank you. 
Stay there for later if you can, Dave. All right. I hope that volume was appropriate. If it was, we will return to that level. Good? Nice. All right. So I, I'm assuming also through this uh, computer device, you guys could hear the baseline of the difference tones, correct? All right, good. Um, there's also uh, some other things that, there's some things that Hendrix tapped into beside the feedback. Um, you know, we just played a gig uh, Thursday. We were up in upstate New York this past Thursday with the band, 13 o'clock, playing for uh, Anastasia Solberg, who's a tremendous uh, violist who's played all the Harry Parch stuff. And we've known her for many years. Uh, she was in the early festivals and in my orchestral stuff and uh, she booked us up there with the band and we were playing in this old church and it had been built by shipbuilders and the church from the inside looked like a giant ship that had been turned upside down and the sound in there was incredible it was it wasn't washed out like a stone church would be because it was all wood so it had a warmth and a reverberant quality uh, so we did the sound check with a very soft song and, and the video guy, you know, had a problem and he was like, oh, you're way too loud. You're not going to be able to to play this, you know, to, we're not going to be able to record it if you play that loud. And, and the drummer said, well, that's our softest song. So it was one of those things where we had to work out. Um, we really had to play to the room, but um, it turned out we played our normal volume and everything was fine. I think uh, part of the... Uh, the, the fun for me is, is being in a room and actually figuring out how to compress the room to get uh, feedback and clouds at a low volume. So um, since I've been interested in feedback all my life, ever since hearing it at uh, 13 or 14, um, I've you know tried to find out techniques and equipment and positions to stand where I can tap into this feedback, uh, you know, and uh, at a low volume so we were able to do that and maybe because of this guy's you know pushing against us a little bit the feedback was i just felt like it was one of those nights and guitar players know what i'm talking about sometimes the feedback will just it's a light takes on a life of its own and when that happens you just roll with it and close your eyes and, and just enjoy the ride and that's what happened so uh that's all thanks to jimmy too because his, his use of feedback was so musical and and mind-blowing and you can't really capture that with a microphone. If you guys are trying to record it, that's going to capture one frequency that dominates. Feedback is an envelopment of a number of frequencies interacting when you get it right. And um, that has to be heard live. So uh, if you heard Hendrix live, good on you. You know, it's, it's kind of like Lamont stuff. Yeah, the recordings are great. And you can really get off on those recordings. But to be in that room live is an incredible experience. So somehow... This blues guys and, and Hendrix, who took from those guys, were tapped into this intuition thing. And um, Hendrix w would intuit voodoo rhythms and Haitian voodoo ritual rhythms. People would tell him after the fact, oh, you know, that's a voodoo rhythm. And he wouldn't know, but he would intuit it. Uh, one of the important things he intuited was, as Johnny mentioned, a harmonic rhythm. So harmonic rhythm is where we take the actual rhythm of the overtone and give it its own place in time its proper place in time that it and uh, one way to think of this is I talk about the one hertz system because that's what science has given us as far as a uh, litmus test or a you know something where we can see what all the pitches are and the one hertz system does that it's um, you know one hertz is the same as two hertz just an octave below four hertz eight hertz 16 all the way up to say 512 is that C in that range so um, if you take the one hertz pitch of C and play against it the two hertz pitch of the octave higher C, that two hertz pitch will be twice in that second where the one hertz pitch will be once. So it'll go bop, 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 bop. Then if you go up to the third harmonic in the key of C, that's going to be a G. That G, the third harmonic, by its number is going to uh, beat three times, three hertz. It's going to be three times in that second. So that's going to go bop, 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 bop in that one second. Um, the same with the fourth uh, and et cetera. As you get higher, they get complex very quick and these polyrhythms come in and you hear a time chord of notes having their own space in time. 
So how does this relate to Hendrix? He, uh, beside doing the, a lot of blues guys did triplets on the five, or the, the third harmonic, but um, Hendrix's, some of his most famous songs use the first harmonic rhythm that we just mentioned, one and two at the same time. So if you take the um, important elements of one, it's just one. And then the important element of two is that it's hitting a second time. So it's the full one and two would be both pitches on the, on the one, then just two. But you commonly hear it as the octave. Okay, so um, I'm just going to play a short excerpt of one of his pieces now. Uh, he had a number of pieces that used that harmonic rhythm, the first harmonic rhythm, like Foxy Lady and other ones. Um, if, if I can get my, my tech person to put the volume back down, I'll play you another piece of his that I hope you recognize that um, this is a seven limit harmonic version of uh, one of Jimmy's pieces that uses harmonic rhythm. straight harmonic rhythm up front the bass player was also doing harmonic rhythm but on a, on a note that was a um, tritone apart so uh, that was that so um, when we talk about these ratios um, that we talk about in harmonic series tuning um, I think of them as they have a couple of meanings the ratios uh, and it it's just a little bit of math that we have to understand and, and you know some of you guys might already know this stuff, but it's always good to see different perspectives on ratios. Um, it's it's a, a simple ratio represents both an interval and a pitch. So if we have a ratio that says, say, 3 over 2, then we have that third harmonic, which in the key of a C is a G, and we have 2, which is the C. So we have the interval of a perfect fifth. But if you don't specify what the 2 is or what the fundamental is, a 3-2 is just a fifth. So you can have a 3-2 from the 3. It would be the ninth, 3 times 3. Um, so those ratios are pretty simple to understand, and um, they have a couple of different meanings. They can denote a specific pitch if we specify one of the numbers, the numerator or denominator. Either one, we can figure out the other pitch. Or they specify a specific interval that can be used freely in any key. Um, and... There's a lot of other things about ratios that dawn on, well, for me, that over time they're more easily understood. So, you know, nobody should be worried about the math. It's, it's very satisfying, actually, that the math is, is so pure and beautiful in harmonic series tuning. Um, in fact, you know, while we had this uh, pandemic, um, we had some downtime. And my band members happen to be in town. And um, of course, when you have downtime, you know, sometimes you find yourself doing math. I mean, I know, not often, but it can happen. 
so that's what that's what happened. We find ourselves doing a little bit of math, and it was this um, this realization that the you know, Fibonacci series um, contained elements that were overlapping with the harmonic series, but extending it in a certain way, and also that the Fibonacci series is constantly approximating closer and closer the, to the golden ratio. So every step up the Fibonacci series is a little bit closer to the golden ratio. Um, this spiral, it results in a spiral, and that spiral is in DNA, it's in our ears, it's in the shape of galaxies, and even in the sound wave itself. We see sound waves depicted as up and down. That's because it's, it's two-dimensional. A sound wave is really like a slinky. It's really a spiral. So even sound itself is a spiral. So how, uh, how can we not figure this out? How can we not hear what it sounds like? So we started writing pieces like um, the video we played for you guys last season called Dog Bite. And this is on our, these videos are uh, coming up on our YouTube channel, Free Note Music, all one word. Um, and so I would urge anybody to subscribe to that if you want. It's free and you just get, uh, you know, announcement when we put out a new video. And that helps us get uh, to monetize it when we have subscribers, um, at, even though there's no cost to you. So um, we did a piece called Dog Bite, which we took the spiral and we parsed it out between three players, guitar, organ, and bass. And when we did that, we could easily hear that it was a three-part spiral. So my, my part, I would start with eight. The organ would play 13. The bass would play 21. Okay, so right there, we're in a straight Fibonacci series from eight. The, the numbers we're getting are just adding up the numbers before it. So eight and five is 13. Uh, 13 and eight is 21, and so on. When it got uh, above 21, we were adding a 21 and, um, and 13. So we're getting 34, which half of that is 17. So I started on eight, which is 16, and now my notes come back to me and my next pitch is 17. I thought that was significant. That really, and then, uh, you know, the, the 13 that uh, the organ played after 34 is 55. And, and, you know, the 55 is just above the 13. And then same with the bass. His next note was just above 21. So everyone was moving in very small stepwise motion in this triple spiral. And I, don't, I could never tell that the Fibonacci series was a triple spiral by looking at the numbers. It, I had to hear it in audio and realize, oh, I see what's happening. Each one's going up a step. So this spiral is built in three points. And each point goes up as it uh, is passed around. So um, in that Fibonacci series, if you start with one and two, your next note is three. This is just out of the harmonic series. Uh, three and two is five, okay? So we have uh, right away in the, in the Fibonacci series, we have a major triad. That in itself is interesting. Um, where does it go from there? It goes from five and three is eight, so we're back up to the tonic. Now we have a, a, a pure major triad, and our next note is eight plus five is 13. So now we see something different because we have a, what's called a neutral interval. This is a neutral sixth. And whether or not neutral is a good name or not, yeah, the, it, it's, other names could be proposed for the thing because the interval doesn't necessarily sound neutral, but it is between a major sixth and a minor sixth. And it's the first neutral interval that appears in the Fibonacci series. Um, and why is the Fibonacci series approaching, why does it introduce this neutral interval? Because from eight to 13, all the intervals after that, remember, we're getting closer to the golden ratio every time, every time we go up this Fibonacci series. So by going eight to 13, that's the first instance of, in the Fibonacci series of a neutral interval. And that's what the golden ratio is. Strangely enough, it's a neutral interval. Yeah, it's responsible for, you know, this major triads and all that, but those are kind of warming up to this higher level of pitch recognition, which involves the 13th. So for, that's one of the reasons that it seems like 13 could be a gateway to learning more because it's giving us uh, insight into something beyond the, the normal system, but that I believe is a consonance. And you know, everyone knows Kathleen Schlesinger from the Parch book, she postulated that 13th could be a consonance. But um, you know, we put out records since 1996 
with the 13th harmonic in them, in jazz, blues, rock, classical, everything, and it really is a consonant. So um, you can use that interval, 8 to 13, as a chord progression also. You can make chord progressions out of the Fibonacci series. Um, and it does the same thing melodic, harmonically as it had done melodically. It's, you know, going, taking that golden ratio and letting you go to that area. Uh, so what do you do when you get to 13? You can play a harmonic series of 13, or you can combine that harmonic series of 13 with some of your original notes, because that's how the Fibonacci series works. It's related to what comes before and what comes after. So it's not really a standalone thing. It's all a through line. Um, so I think the best thing to do now would be to play uh, an example of this. You've already heard Dog Bite, and we're going to have another piece um, coming out soon that has the, this Fibonacci spiral as eighth notes for each player. It's passed around very fast. Um, but um, this piece is going to be the title. Um, we're going to play a little video for you now. This one's called Whirlwind. Whirlwind, it's the title song off of this uh, new, new record that's coming out. And it's... Um, the idea was during that pandemic, we kind of realized, you know, everyone's breathing the same air here. It's, it's, it's a wind that's going around the world, a wind that's carrying a, a virus, and we're all breathing it. We're all susceptible to it. It's connecting us all in a weird way. And really, we can really see how small this planet is and how fragile it is. Um, so this, this piece has some, you know, notes in it that kind of speak to that. And then when it goes to the bridge, the chord progression is we go from the a tonality of the, based on the eighth harmonic to one based on the thirteenth harmonic, and then down again to a tonality based on the eleventh harmonic, and then to a tonality based on the ninth harmonic. So we have to play in improvising. We have to play tonally through all these tonal centers by improvising. Um, and um, anyway, here here it comes. If we can get this up, this is called Whirlwind. Meredith, we, we, we can't see anything yet. Excuse me? We, we can't see anything yet and hear. Okay, all right, let me try it. Let me start it again. It, it's, I can see it, but I don't, I'm not sure why you can't. Hang tight. Sorry. I'm not sure what's going on because I did optimize it for sound. You can't see it. You can just hear it. But it's like when you're in a real Zoom situation. Tech is always something that requires improvisation. And we are always at the ready. Vitold takes care of the tech. Same deal. You can't see. You can't see my screen.
to the beginning.
John, John, John is a guy who <clears throat> makes concrete everything he says. Was that, uh, you guys got that? Oh, thank you. You know, it, it's certain. Yeah, it's, you know, we, we've been emphasizing ephemera a lot, and it just, I just love how it just keeps coming to the forefront of the conversation. It becomes the priority when before it was just ignored, you know? It becomes the meat. I'm sorry if you're vegetarian, but you know, it's a metaphor. You know, it's this, the essence, the body, you know, the corporeal, the, the physical, the vibrating Can I play physical. Can I play I'm filling in here as John gets ready. <laughs> yeah. This one? It's the top one. Down? It's the top one. That's it, right? <coughs> top knob. Top knob. All right, well, you know, is there any, any questions about anything on any of those pieces that, you know, that we've done today? Well, first of all, raise your volume again if you could. You're talking yeah. volume. Yes. Any uh, questions about any of that stuff we hit on today? I have certainly comments. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, it's I, I love the way you make concrete what you say. That's, you know, impeccable. But some of our terminology is going to be is distinctive to each individual as the way we hear. And I don't know, when you say that the 13th are consonant, I feel like you're speaking to a, a world of, you know, historical musicologists and books and, you know, people who have said the 11th harmonic is out of tune, trumpet players don't play it. At the same time, the 81st harmonic is just a harmonic. It's not so much a ditone of ancient history. And it's, it's used, you know, by, let's say, the Falterhausen organ. It's used in a modern world sound, besides being a thousand years of the Middle Ages and some other cultures like China, for example. Anyway, uh, I don't know if that 81st harmonic is any worse than any other harmonic. It's the tradition that we've inherited that makes us feel that way. And, and you know, it was similar to what Philip was saying last week, you know, and how he felt about the Pythagorean third. And the context, also from the last week discussion, I think, you know, it's very important because words are what we make them. And to say if a certain harmonic is a consonance or dissonance, you know, applies in a certain context because in a certain context, it sounds like a consonance or like a dissonance, you know, in itself, it, it, it's kind of neither, it's, it's just a sound, if that makes sense. And, and, and it does make sense because to tag that with the comment you made, John, about Hendrix using this tritone relationship. When he uses that tritone relationship, would you say it's consonant in the way he's using it? He's giving a huge middle finger to, he's saying, look, here's the devil's interval. Here's the tritone through a couple of martial stacks. You know, this is his. Yeah, but what's the sound though? The sound is really consonant the way we hear it. We like it. Is it constant or is it an ear catcher that it's like it wakes you up and says, oh, that's uh, something potent. So that's the difference between the way people hear, I think. You know, I hear it that way. I hear it as a consonant. 
So I hear, you know, the whole harmonic series as one sound, one chord that does it, that's immutable, doesn't move, doesn't modulate. It's like the Indian uh, tambura, you know, anchor. And so to pick any one of them is like to say, I like this color better than this color. Right? This color is no good. We can't use this color. But this color is okay. And yet they're all happening at the same time, major and minor at the same time. In other words, sure, the undertone series has a raison d'etre. It has its undertone historical relationship that goes all the way through parts. But it's not necessarily how each individual hears. And so like as each of us pick our own directions, they're going to be by nature totally different from everything else. So we're going to be like this. And by using just speaking, you know, like we talked about earlier, that this is not music intelligence, this is verbal intelligence. We are finding a way, I'm trying to find a way that we can all talk, communicate. But, you know, every time you say those particular things, what's consonant, what's not consonant, I imagine for a lot of people, people have different takes on that. I think there's, I've always thought there's been a consensus, at least on this planet, a global consensus, that the triad was consonant. They teach you in music school, the seventh chord is turbulent, needs to resolve, but it's used in popular music. So if you just take the popular music, what's in usage, you'll find uh, diminished chords, augmented chords everywhere, seventh chords, flat nines, all that stuff has been accepted in popular music right and i'm just saying the same thing actually i'm saying we just extend it further i do right i'm saying that i extend it further but it's the same thing in fact i might add and this you know it's good that Jacques is here that i'd love his feedback on this i would add that if you focus on the smaller numbers exclusively which you don't but if you did it would be tedious after a while unless you're incredibly creative and inventive with rhythm with text with politics ideology you know something else but then you know it's like one flavor of ice cream um. Military, military music is based on the on the first uh, harmonics. <laughs> the bugle wakes you up in the morning in harmonics, right? Yeah, when you say ratio, right? You say rationalize. The word rationalize. This is not verbal intelligence. Can say I'm going to rationalize something. It's not really true. But I'm going to make it true by the way I speak about it. I'm going to force fit it into what people expect to hear. So I'm now rationalizing. Maybe because I'm, you know, dissembling. I don't want to tell you the truth. Or I might find a way to, to uh, describe a statistic in my favor. So rationalize, just the word rationalize with the word ratio in it can have different interpretations, like if it's going out or it's coming in, for example. Like when you play a scale and you play it up, then you play it down. They're really two different scales. I sometimes prefer one over the other. And then some, some composers always start at the top and go down. And yet, when you talked about the spiral, it went up. And that's a terrific positive metaphor. Right, because we always say, oh, he's spiraling down the drain. And who wants to get lower and lower and lower, right? We, so that's, those are my comments. Interesting, yeah, if there's an upward spiral, there has to be a downward spiral. 
they've got to coexist. So I don't know if we if we don't know what 85% of the matter or space is in our seen universe, then we've got to make allowances for these kinds of mysteries to kind of have space in our head. But there is a reality of what people accept as consonance and dissonance. So if you were to get a group of people and put them in a room and you played a 12 tone fifth, I bet, you know, everybody would say that's consonant. But there might be one person that says it sounds dissonant, who knows. But if you were to play a 12 tone major third, probably people would say it's consonant. If you were to play a just major third followed by a 12 tone major third, they might say that 12 tone major third is dissonant because they've never had anything before to compare it to. And once they compare it, they, they, they would hear the pure 5-4 beatless. And then if you play them the major third, giving them enough time to acclimate to that pure third, play the 12-tone uh, third, and it's going to vibrate. It'd be interesting to see what they say and what their perception of cons consonances is, because it could change over time. So just as you said about ratios, there's different information you can get from that. So your, your um, focus is on what most people would say uh, about what consonant is. I'm sort of just given up to it being a cultural construct, very much like Sammy was talking about earlier today. Um, the uh, tritone that you suggested Hendrix was saying was evil or devilish happened hundreds of years after the period that it was ascribed to. History lied. They told us the wrong period when this was supposed to be, you know, demonic. They lied. So I, you know, I personally don't want to define consonants by that lie. So I'm looking at it differently than what most people think. And, and again, I'm just one person. And there are going to be other people who have different views. Uh, Sammy's view was completely challenged uh, by Praveen, who's still here listening to you. And uh, it was because of the free will for an independent individual to do what they want with the material. As always being true. In fact, what's a composer if they don't have the free will enough to make something fresh that no one's heard? So uh, anyway, uh, we've extended ephemera to include the imagination of that kind of thinking. So ephemera is, is more than, you know, you, you gave this delicious presentation of the undertone relationships, you know, that bass line that was nowhere being played. And then you gave another fantastic presentation of the Hendrix distortion and your focus of it, right? And we already had that in the first session in terms of uh, the way the sounds are, are we, I'd hate to say ornamented, really. I heard vibratos below the note. I heard trajectories going from below, from above. All of this changes the way you hear things, you know, let alone the actual distortion. Or how they were approached. Yeah. And how important that was to the sound. To the meaning. So, um, you know, it, 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 to me, it's the bigger world that we're all here trying to connect. Not to standardize and not to be culturally specific, which throws out the lies, of course, because that's culturally specific. But even the truths, they're culturally specific. So to throw that out and start fresh, just from a communication in words and in English, that's the challenge. Right. Well, one, one thing I would say is that my focus has never been on what most people consider consonants or distance. My focus has been on if you collate everything, the, the bulk of or the totality of humans' knowledge about music, if you, if you try to learn from all the cultures and all the people and all the popular cultures and 
all the indigenous music and all the vibration experts and then see what it looks like compared to this the math truths the nature truths that are beyond man then i think you start to see these threads and that's why i draw the thread between 8 to 13 because i see it in the fibonacci series as the first nod towards okay we're going to accept this neutral interval now up until eight it's all been pretty straight and humanity as a whole has accepted that you know separate this culture or that culture as a whole humanity as a totality of yes but beings. that's an extension of what people say you're talking still about what do other people say that's humanity well, there was no 13 harmonic music that you could hear when we started this. You couldn't say, all right, I want to hear what that's... I'm talking about what they've done. And what they did is in rock and roll, they added distortion. They added these harmonics through the amplifiers. And because of that, they had to simplify the harmonic language a little bit. So the chords became a little less complex. That 13th chord that Joe Pass played or Wes Montgomery played, with that distortion, that didn't sound so good. It was too jumbled. So they had to simplify the harmonic language and with that in order to increase the gain, the saturation of harmonics of their instrument tone. So what I've tried to do is, you know, I have massive gain, but I've tried to get that to line up with the fretting. And then you have something that is, it's not, it's in popular music due to the just nature of the distortion amplifiers. And then on the other side, in the jazz or, or classical worlds with the more complex chords or polychords, but bringing them together is, for me, you know, probably the focus. I understand. Um, let's talk about our friend Lamont Young for a moment. He brought in, and he changed two notes on the well-tuned piano, which would normally be just 12 notes. Still is 12 notes. But he changed two, and now he has three notes, and I say now meaning late 90s at the end of his playing several performances, maybe more than several performances of the well-tuned piano. They got longer and longer. Distortion in the sense of ephemera got greater and greater. He throws in a note in the 10th octave of the overtone series, a note in the 11th octave, a note in the 8th octave, uh, uh, 12th octave, excuse me, 12th octave. So he goes out of what I would call 128 to bring in single notes of his choice, which can probably work. I'm sure they can be worked out in just intonation in terms of ratios that they came from a multiplication of smaller numbers. Is that true, John? Yes. Okay. But he kind of did a flip in his acknowledgement of them as higher harmonics in terms of designating what they are versus how he constructed them or how he found them. Maybe it's more how he found them. But these three notes probably don't exist on the planet before, right? Probably there's no culture that uses those three notes. Which three are you referring to? The one he adds from the 8th octave, the ninth, and the 10th octave of the Overtone series. Excuse me, the ninth, 10th, and 11th. I keep getting that wrong. Right, we don't know any previous record of somebody using those notes. Right. There's no record of these three notes, let alone some in the 8th possibly, but I doubt that. I think they're used. But these three, probably not. But is there anything when you listen, I'm saying that openly to everyone here, is there anything that you hear when you listen to the well-tuned piano that because those three notes are used, something has changed or is wrong or is alien? And to my ear, I'd say no. I would also say that because they all derive for one family from the harmonic series. So it's all, you know, in one place already. So it will work together cohesively and that's why I'd say it has the same zonk it's still the same chord 
doesn't modulate, it's anchored. Doesn't, I mean, look, we could talk about moving the anchor, different instruments electronically, that's all possible. On my bassoon, please don't make me move from A, <laughs> you know? I'd hate to have to develop all those fingerings all over again in all those different places, you know? I was very frustrated, as you know, John, when you switched from 31 tone. <laughs> it killed me. I mean, I had, I'd started with quarter tones and now 31, and now you want to switch again? And, and then even in between, you had to go to 60 cycles that already changed everything by 41 cents or something like that. 38? I can't remember. Anyway, uh, that's terrific. Is somebody here want to say something, respond? Because you played some great music today. Thanks. Yeah, I would like to. Uh, John, I really love that tri that Spanish cash toll magic tribute that you did. Oh, thank you, Joe. And it really resonated with me at this particular time because I think uh, most of you guys know that I'm working with Jonathan Glazier on the archiving the immense amount of stuff that Ivor Darig left behind. And one of the things that we found was a postcard from 1969 from Adrian Fokker to Ivor Darig. And the whole, aside from a little note that he wrote on the front of the postcard, the whole back of it is musical notation that Fokker wrote out exploring difference tones. So he wrote these little uh i mean eventually it'll be up on the web and everyone will be able to see it he wrote these little examples and suggested that ivor play them on his guitar i don't know what guitar he was talking about because other than you know ivor had some microtonal guitars at that time but he didn't have one in 31 yet and fokker wrote the notation in his 31 edo notation but he also wrote the partial numbers so the exact frequencies can be determined and I made Tonescape files of these, but couldn't hear the difference tones because they just didn't come out on the Tonescape file. But the way you're doing it, they do come out. And I, I just find that fascinating. It's great. Wow, thanks, Jim. I'd like that's, to... Uh, that's awesome. I don't, know, I don't know if you could ever play these Fokker examples because they're actually 47 prime limit just, J.I. They use partials that go up to 47. So... Well, I could estimate those ones that high by a little bit of bending here and there, but have you tried pumping it through, um, you know, when you get when you get a high gain amp, like a Marshall or something, there's a lot of distortion happening up high, and it creates these difference tones down below naturally, so those high gain amps can have a lot of uh, difference tones to them. I wonder if you want to pump that sound through a, an amp like that. Yeah, I'd have to try that. I mean, all I've done so far is just hear it on my computer. I haven't put it through any sound, any kind of amplification or anything at all yet. Oh, well, those difference tones, since they're in the bass, they need a, a little extra power and a little extra mm -hmm. volume. And once you get the power and volume, then all of a sudden they'll really start speaking. So, And it also depends right. on the timbre, because with pure sound right. waves, you have, really, you have some troubles hearing different tones. It, from low, from high. I put it well. I put it in acoustic guitar timbre since that's what mm -hmm. Fokker suggested Ivor play it on, you know. But obviously, an acoustic guitar is not going to really bring it out. But if I made it an electric guitar timbre and put it through an amplifier with some distortion, then it should come out. Yeah. Yeah. But I, anyway, I that was great. I loved. I loved hearing Hendrix's melody not being played. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks, Rand. What I do for the different stones, I put it on the pickup closest to the neck, and then I roll the bass, the uh, treble off. So that gets rid of, otherwise the treble content will obscure the different stones a little. So right. That might, that might help also. Okay. Okay. It was cool. And uh, I think it's safe to say, on some level, I hope, that people like um, uh, Robert Dick, you know, uh, Ned Rothenberg, and what I do on bassoon is to try to create that with uh, circular breathing, uh, multiphonics, where two separate longitudinal vibrations are rubbing together, and each multiphonic has them at a different starting point, and then we can flail them differently, 
And, you know, we're creating a acoustic distortion. Uh, now, yeah, I've, we... I've seen you do that live, Johnny. I've seen you play multiphonics where you're getting two notes out of your bassoon, but creating a third one below it. And I thought that was really fantastic. Yeah. Well, that's where we, that's where what we do is physics and where tuning is two dimensional. Okay, that's 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 why Joe, when you get, you know, um, equipment, technology equipment, to get the ephemera, it doesn't work. Uh, ephemera, especially, somehow needs, you know, what John is doing on guitar, or what Jimi Hendrix did on guitar, where as great as the recording sound of the well-tuned piano by Lamont Young, they don't sound the same as if you're there. And I bet they don't sound the same as they did to Lamont, whose hands are vibrating on the Bosendorfer. You know? That's a good point. So you're saying that the physical creation, uh, having a vibrating string or reed or something, is important to the complexity of the sound and the completeness of the sound. Right. And Meredith would argue, of course, and she's there, just the whole body. Yes. So that's part of the new understanding. It's also part of how we listen. You know, uh, I, I learned something from Paul Ehrlich the other day. I was just reading a math thing. Usually a math doesn't work as well for me as it might do, uh, for you. But uh, I was very impressed to hear that the harmonics are logarithmic. And, and the only reason that it makes sense is when you don't think of them as the overtone series, but you think of them as, you know, one, two, three, four, five, like you talk in terms of Hertz. And all of a sudden it's like an equal temperament because of the way it comes out in vibrations. And that's independent of the individual indios, indos, idiosyncratic non-linearity of the human ear, which then has two kinds of ephemera. We used to talk about it with David Hikes, you know, how much of the different tones are, and, and Lamont gets into this too, I'm not sure they agree, how much the different tones are physical realities and how much are the different tones appearing within your head? And the answer is probably both. Well, I have taken uh, a G sharp, the fifth harmonic of E, and a D half flat, the seventh harmonic of E, played them as a dyad into the tuner because seven minus five is two, the tuner registers two and E. So I'm playing the seventh and the fifth, uh, it registers as an E. So that means it's not just created in the head, in some way it's manifesting in some type of reality that the tuner can recognize it. But that's what I'm saying, it's both. It, it both doesn't mean they're the same. Both yeah, means they're physical. I mean, the human comes uh, when the, 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 how you kind of uh, perceive it or how audible is, is it to you? Because it's, I think, always there. It's just a physical kind of property of sound. Yes, it's also physical, but not always physical in the same way as it's idiosyncratic in your own head. For example, when, when Lamont Young did the earlier recordings of the well-tuned piano, and he made the recordings to sell, the CDs, actually cassette for me, the idea was, this was Lamont's idea, because I interviewed him about it and published it. The idea was that the, that the ephemera, which was never called ephemera, we called it clouds, and you did today, the, the ephemera would be recreated in your head 
And so it, it didn't need to be recorded in the room, which was a very conflicting position for the recording engineer. So I don't think Lamont was as happy with the final products in the beginning because there was no emphasis to record the clouds. And probably by the time we got to the one of six and a half hours, we tried to, you know, the sound was, the, the purpose was to get the clouds too. And so more of it is on the recording than was on it before. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, th that's yeah, not exactly no right. Sorry. Um, he, I asked him immediately once I saw the miking of the well. I said, "Why are you close miking it? Don't you want to capture the clouds?" And he said, "No, we want to. We've tried this, and they had been through experiments for years, and they found that the best way to capture the clouds was to recreate the clouds in a different space. And to do that, they close mic the strings of the Bosendorfer." And when you took that recording and played it back in your room through your speakers, and it would create the uh, ephemera or clouds in that room. Yes, it, it really does work. It, it is. Uh, it, it just did you it. Said what I, what I wanted to, John. So yes, that's exactly Sorry. same thing. Yeah, yeah. But I would say it didn't work as well as when you recorded for the clouds as well too, in, because in then. The the ephemera is greater because some of it is physical and to to cut the physical out of the recording i think that changed i hear it has changed i used to know the engineer i forgot his name do you remember his name bob balecki bob balecki so Bob Balecki is the kind of guy where we did the poem for chairs, tables, benches, etc. a piece of Lamont's, where you rub on wood these properties, these as instruments. We did it at the Greenwich House in uh, Greenwich Village, New York, and we took over this big building which had three floors, several different stairwells, all wood. And Bob Balecki had a separate mic in every single place. The piece sounds like dinosaurs in a, in a stampede, okay? And it's, you know, about 45 minutes. And Bob mixed it, you know, with all of these mics. So that's why I understand why Bob Belecki probably wanted to get more of the room later, because there is a difference when you get that sound quality and you mix it together. That's my supposition. Well, that piece sounds like, and that recording sounds like it would be right for an Atmos or surround sound presentation. And I worked with Bob Belecki last year. He, he has installed at his place a, um, Kind of a surround sound multi-speaker <laughs> setup so you might want to speak to him about that i'm glad he's still alive thanks for the heads up <laughs> okay terrific yeah, i'll talk to you after john about getting a contact for bob i would love to f definitely want to find out if this makes sense to him okay. thank you Anybody else would like to ask a question of John? Make a comment? I know Praveen, I saw you for a moment. All right, well. It's, I guess we're it's good. Getting, it's getting late, but uh, next time, uh, we, we discussed Lamont today. Next time, next class, I'm going to present a piece that I wrote for Marion, his wife. Um, and it uses the pitches that um, from the well-to piano, including the ones you mentioned, Johnny. Excellent. Okay, looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. See you next week for our Composers Forum. Take care.